नहीं नहीं दिन जी है साहब ऐसा क्या लगा कोई बात नहीं है दो मिनट दो मिनट और एक मिनट वो कह रही चुप करना यार चुप करना है दिल दी भाई साइलेंट हो जाए यार मीडिया वाले ओपन करें अभी वो आ जाएंगे वो पीछे का डालेंगे तो अभी पता चल जाएगा क्या है जैसे दिल की धड़कन नहीं होती वैसी नहीं नहीं बात तो आ रही है भैया बीच में नाउ टुडे इज गोइंग टू बी अ स्केरी शो सो आई एम जस्ट गिविंग यू अ डिस्क्लोजर It's not for the faint of heart but all of you need to hear it at least one time in your life. Khibuta kever literally translates the beatings of the grave. What happens after you die? You get beat up in the grave. What kind of beatings? That's what we're going to go over today. The Ramban writes here the Mishnah and he says always be aware from where you have come and where you are destined to go. and you will realize that in life you are as frail as the maggot or the worm all the more so in a death the gemara says there's a malach there's an angel and the angel's name is laila and laila comes up to a kadosh baruch hu and says ashem what will be with this sea what will be with it will he be rich or poor will it be he or she Will be tall or short? Will he be someone that is going to be smart or stupid? What will it be? The sea. What's going to be with this one? Who is the zivuk for this one? Akadosh Baruch Hu already decides whether you're going to be rich or poor. He decides whether you're going to be strong or weak. He decides whether you're going to be able to see or not. He decides whether you're going to have good hearing or bad hearing. He can decide everything for you. The only thing he does not decide, the only thing he does not tell this malach named Laila is whether you're going to do what Hashem wants you to do or not. Why? That's your free choice. That's what you decide once you're here. But Laila comes to Akadosh Baruch Hu and asks him, Hashem, what will be with this? After Hashem decides, and during the nine months. That you're in your mommy's belly. There's an angel that's sitting next to you and teaching you the entire Torah. That's why sometimes you'll hear some divrei Torah that you never heard before, but you hear, you feel like you've heard it before. You never read it in a book, but you feel like you've heard it before. Why? Because you heard it before. You heard it before, but you never heard it before. But you heard it before. Why? It was in the belly. You know the entire Torah. In essence, all I'm doing is reminding all of you of what you already know. This angel sits with you, Chavuta, nine months. Aleph, Bet, Bereshit, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and so on and so forth. All of the books of the Torah, all of the Midrashim, all of the Gemarot. Everything you learn, he tells you all of the mitzvot too. And before you leave on the day of birth, he says, "You see me. You're gonna see me again. If you fulfill everything we learned, I welcome you with open arms. But if you don't, I won't. Others will welcome you." They're not so nice. And then he hits you on the top of the lip, so you forget everything you've learned. That way, you still have free choice. If you remembered everything you learned, you wouldn't have free choice, and would defeat the purpose of coming to the world. What happens the moment you die? The Zohar Kadosh, Parashat Nasso. 
page 127a, and also Parashat Vayikir, page 99, say that there are seven levels of judgment at death. First is the type of death. How did you die? The Gemara in Maseret Brachot, page 8a, says that there are 903 different types of deaths in this world. The second is the journey that takes place before death, from the time a person dies until they get buried. What happens during that time? Third, whether people are going to show up to your funeral, someone's going to say Kaddish, if the person that's going to say Kaddish is actually a kosher person or not, because if it's not a kosher person, it's better off he doesn't say Kaddish. If it's not a person that keeps Shabbat, it's better off he doesn't say Kaddish. Why? Because you can't even say Amen to his Kaddish, even if he's your son or he's your father or he's anybody. If he doesn't keep Shabbat, his Kaddish is worth nothing. According to the Torah, someone's a Mechalel Shabbat is considered an idol worshiper. So what, you want somebody that's an idol worshiper that worships a different God to go pray for you? After you die, who wants that? That's a problem for you. But if you have a righteous person, say Kaddish on you, you have a good rab, come to the funeral, give everybody chizuk. As Shlomo HaMelech says, it's better to go visit someone at the time of death and mourning than to go to his party, go to his wedding. Why? Party, people make averot, people make sins. No one does tshuva at parties, really. But at funerals, a few people are going to do tshuva. It's better to go to that. The third level of judgment is how you're deposited into the grave. It's the gate. Being deposited into the grave is they, in essence, take the body after they wrap it. Shem yirachem, shem yirachem. They put it into the grave. And that's, in essence, the gate that is leaving this world and entering the next world. The fourth is what happens to the person once they're actually in the grave. What kind of beating are they going to get? What kind of suffering are they going to have in the grave? Now naturally, we're going to say, wait a minute, what's suffering? What are you talking about? The guy's dead. The Gemara says, even though to everybody else, the body is not moving, the heart is not pumping, the brain is not functioning, the eyes don't see, the ears don't hear. When you inflict pain on it, it feels it even more than it does in this world. The fifth is what's going to happen with the maggots and the worms. The maggots eat the inner body. It's the worms that eat the outer body. This is not a pleasant experience. The sixth and seventh, whether they go to heaven or to Gainom. In Gainom there are seven chambers. In heaven there's also seven chambers. And then there's the Galut of the Neshama, which is the seventh level of judgment. Parashat Nasor and Azor says, after everybody leaves, all of the other dead, they start yelling and screaming. If you're a tzaddik or a tzaddikah, they celebrate. Oh, Baruch Haba, Baruch Haba. Shtabach Shimo, we have a tzaddik next to us, we have a tzaddikah next to us. She covered our hair, she covered our body. She did everything good, she gave tzaddikah, she did chesed, she got shurim together. Shtabach Shimo. Wow! It's a yofi, Baruch Haba. Ooh, wife, there, Rasha. The Arizal in Shara Gilgulim is one of the primary sources that discusses what happens in the grave. He says that immediately after everybody leaves and the, all the neighboring souls are doing their yelling and screaming and so on, immediately angels come and they lower the ground of that grave and they deepen it to the height of the person. Tractate Makot is one of his sources. Then they stand them up, they stand her up. Then each of these angels mentioned don't have any aspect of mercy. Holds an end of the body. When you get this corner, you get that corner, you get that corner. That's how the angels hold the body. He's alive now. The soul's back in there. And they start shaking him. And they start beating him with sticks of fire to remove the klipa that separates him from a kadosh Baruch Hu. The more sins that a person makes, the thicker that garment is. What's this klipa? The Ariza goes into it extensively here and throughout the book. The klipa, there's two types. There's one part of the klipa that is something that everyone has. This is from the original sin of Adam Arishon. We were all partners to it. It's a very thin layer of klipa. In essence, you could use an analogy or some type of imaginary uh, look that it's like a spiritual garment. Very thin spiritual garment that we all have. But the other one, 
That all depends on what kind of sins we made. And that person cannot go to the bed of Shamayim until that garment is broken. And that garment is similar to a shell. It's not like a garment soft. It's a garment it's like a shell. And these angels shake him and hit him until it's broken. The thicker it is, the more difficult it is. So imagine someone that's a tzaddik. Someone that's a tzaddik, it's like an eggshell. All you gotta do is tap it in the right place and it breaks. Someone that's a rasha, someone that looks at girls that's not his wife, someone that eats not kosher, someone that uh, didn't do tshuva for being with somebody before they're married, someone that walks around imadis, someone that causes other people to sin, that person's shell is like the safe. The safe has a door. Usually the door is the thickest part, that's their klipa. Now, not all people are the same, the Arizal says. Righteous people who, who during their lives distance themselves from the Yitzhah, humbling themselves, their suffering is obviously much lower, their beating is very limited, could be even non-existent at all if they die on a uh, early during a Friday and they actually get buried on a Friday before Shabbat. But this is not the case, the Arizal says, for evil people. It's just the opposite. As a result of the physical pleasures of this world, they attached and strengthened that klipa to their bodies and their souls even more. This is the secret, this is the sod of why a person is not spared from the beatings of the grave. If it's a wicked person that became lustrous on a regular basis, wasted seed on a regular basis, died without doing tshuva for these things. She liked walking around with only half an outfit because she wants everybody to see the definitions of her body. She walked around without Kisui Rosh because she wanted everybody to see the new hairdo that uh, Oscar from, the, uh, from down the street made for her. She wants everybody at the supermarket to say, how oh, hi, Mrs. So-and-so. How are you? Why? Because she's uh, half naked, so they have to see something. She walked around causing other people to sin. Or better yet, he's a rabbi, he calls himself a rabbi, and he tells people, no, homosexuality, that's ah, not a big deal. There's 613 mitzvot, so what if you make one sin? Like this Rasha Aru and some of his followers that defend him. Homosexuality is a prohibition in the Torah. Whenever gay men come to me and they say, this is their contention, I was born this way, there's nothing I can do to change, you know what my response to them is? There are 613 commandments in the Torah. You have 611 left. That'll keep you pretty damn busy. But this all or, so, all or nothing sum game that if you violate one law like being gay, you're out of the community, that is not Jewish. And I will always protest against it. People like that, Rabotai Yikali, they have become addicted to the sin. So the Arizal says that their klipa is like dough mixed with flour and bread, intricately has become tied together to the point where it's in essence almost a single piece. There's almost no separation. It's almost impossible to break it without some massive, massive beatings because they forgot who's the master of the house. And until that comes off, we're not finished. And this is why it's called Chibuta Kever, the beatings of the grave. If I'm scaring you, that's a good sign. That means your soul is still alive. Now they ask Rabbi Eliezer, how is the beating of the grave? What, what happens? He said to them, the person passes from this world, the Malach HaMavit, the angel of death, comes and sits on top of his grave, beating him. And says, get up and tell me your name. In one hand he's hitting him, in another hand he's holding a book. And that book is your Torah, it's your book, it's your life. Everything you did in your life, in there, it has all of the sins and all of the mitzvot that the person has during their life, every single one, every single time you look somewhere inappropriate, every single time you put something in your mouth inappropriate, every single time you wore something, every single thing you didn't do tshuva for, everything, it's in that book. And he says, what's your name, what's your name, what's your name? 
Why? Because he wants you to admit, yeah, yeah, this is my book, this is my life. Sign off on it. Everything that's in that book, it's my life. So that way, after he does it, then the next part of the judgment can begin. On the first hit, the first time he hits the person, he does it with a chain. And all of the person's limbs are dismembered. The second time he hits them, all of the bones of that person fall apart. And then the, mother, the other ministering angels come and they gather all the bones together and stand them up. And then the Malach Hamavid hits them the third time. And they request him to pay the judgment on everything that he did, justice. This is on the first day and the second day. On the third day, they judge him with more beatings. They hit his two eyes. He looked at things inappropriately. She looked at things inappropriately. They wanted to go on and surf the internet. They hit his ears because he learned Lashon Ara. He accepted. Somebody said Lashon Ara and he said, Wow, really he did that? Wow, really this? If somebody says something about somebody and that person is a righteous person, not a wicked person. You're not allowed to listen to it. It's called Lashon Ara, even if it's true. But the person that you're talking about doesn't want that to be told about them. What if I tell other people, somebody's rich. Is that Lashon Ara? So yes. Maybe that person that you're saying, oh, he's rich. Maybe he doesn't want people to know he's rich. Doesn't have every uh, single tzedakah box show up at his house at 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night with the little folder. Staka, staka, yeah, I just came from Zimbabwe, I just came from Israel, I just came from here, I just came from here. Okay, Habibi, why do you, how do you know where I live? How do you know? Steve and uh, Ruven over there, they told me that you're rich. Oh, it's Lashon Ara. You listen to that Lashon Ara, you're also part of the crime. It's not just the person that says Lashon Ara, it's also the person that hears it and it's the person that accepts it. If you spoke Lashon Ara, they hit his lips too. Somebody likes to curse. They want to speak like a truck driver. They hit his mouth. What about his feet? Well, it depends. Did he go to Shil Torah? Or did he go to the bar? If he went to the bar and he went to play basketball on Shabbat and he went to all the different nice places that are not Torah, he wanted to go to the beach to see all the naked people. Or he wanted to go to the fake Shil Torah where they only have food but no Torah because they pay $20 over there. He wanted to go over there so they could teach him that some rabbi that died a few years ago, he's the Mashiach. He wanted to go over there so they could teach him kfirah, they could teach him nonsense. He wanted to go over there where they said there's no Geno. He wanted to go over there to a place where they said that all of Am Yisrael is going to Gan Eden. If you're Moshe Rabbeinu or you're Bilam Rasha, you're, everybody's going to Gan Eden. Eternal damnation can't mean you will burn in hell forever. Because hell can't go on forever, it's evil. Evil doesn't go on forever. So it can't be punishment forever. Besides the fact that it's pointless. It was punishment forever. Not getting anywhere. There is eternal end, eternal darkness, not punishment, when the soul stops being who, he, who it was, loses all its memory and its characteristics, and just becomes energy, that's eternal. It will forever be energy and not itself anymore. Where is Hitler's soul? In hell? No way. If Hitler came to hell, everybody else would leave. Hell means the cleansing adjustment that the soul goes through to salvage all the goodness that was there and is maybe a little fapachkit, you know, with, uh, with, the, with the misbehaviors. But when a soul has nothing to salvage, it just stops being what it was and becomes generic energy. Then the angels have to hit his legs too because he used them to run to sin. And Chazal says, someone that uses his feet to hasten his sin, then they hastily bring the angel of death upon him. What about a person that says bad things about another person that's a righteous person? This person is going to have a special treatment. He's going to have another death upon death called Askara. What's Askara? The Gemara in Masechet Brachot is that the throat closes slowly. And little by little, he can't breathe, but he's still alive. And he can't breathe, and he's still alive. And it's like the slowest level of torture that possibly exists in the world. You want to say bad things about righteous people? This is what happens. Chapter 3 of Rashid Chochma, Chibut HaKevel. Rabbi Meir Baal Anes says in the name of Rabbi Eliezer, the judgment which Hashem carries out on a person in the grave is even harsher than the judgment of Geinom. Rabbi Yonatan Ibeshit, Allah Shalom said, in the book, Ya'arod Vash, he says if people only knew what punishment exists in Geinom, they'd literally start crying hysterically. And then Rabbi Meir Balanez says, by the way, 
the chibuta kever for the reshaim, it's even worse than geinom. I don't know what that means. All I know is that's really bad. Why is it so much worse? He says the geinom is limited because he gets judged for the vast majority of his sins from the age of 20, with the exception of wasting seed. But then Rabbi Meir says the judgment that's in the grave, the beating of the grave, everyone has to go through, even babies that are being nursed, even a miscarriage. Everyone has to go through this. The Ramban writes here and he says, if the Yetzirah appears and you don't know what to do, always be aware from where you have come and where you are destined to go and you will realize that in life, you are as frail as the maggot or the worm, all the more so in a death. But at some point, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, time's up, son. Come back to Abba. If you made the right decisions, you have not much to worry about, other than there's going to be a little bit of pain in the beginning because there's chibut for everybody, but it's not the same level for everyone. So how could a person be saved from the chibut kever at least? He should love being rebuked, he should love charity, bring guests to his house, pray with full kavanah, meaning told, stop doing this, do tshuva, love doing kindness, helping people get closer to Hashem is the ultimate kindness, help people that are helpless, get people to come to the shul, get people to watch the shul. Kadosh Baruch Hu has patience for us to do tshuva despite our many sins, He'll give us another chance, another chance, another chance. In this world, in the next world, there's no more patience. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is merciful because despite that sometimes a word against God comes out, once in a while by accident, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally on purpose, we say something against God. Hashem says, I'll be patient, I'll be merciful. Most of these only apply to this world. When a neshama leaves this world, there's no more mercy. And just like he has the ultimate love for his people, unfortunately, when a person leaves this world, it's pure judgment. If you are a tzaddik or a tzaddikah, you're praiseworthy, your share is praiseworthy. You're gonna have so much good, you're gonna say, Adli dies, enough, Hashem, enough, so much good. Unfortunately, if a person didn't do anything, continued being a Mechalel Shabbat, continuing driving to the Beit Knesset on Shabbat, continuing going with Goyot, continuing touching women without, uh, you know, without being married, continuing touching his wife. He keeps doing it, she keeps doing it, she keeps walking around like she's some uh, runway model. You want to keep doing it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says when the time runs out, judgment, only thing that arrives is judgment. If you did good, you'll get paid for good. You did bad, unfortunately you get paid for bad. Reshit Chochmah in chapter 12 of Shara Yira says the following One angel hits him Another angel counts how many hits Because there's a judgment in heaven of how many hits he's allowed to hit him The third angel shoots out fire from his own body like a furnace And the fourth angel brings the bitter and sour grasses from the mountains in case he stole from his friend or from other people, if you have eaten stolen property with your teeth. And then another angel shows up and brings the neshama of his parents, his mother and his father. And then after the parents are dumbfounded because they sent him to a school that's 
public school or to a college university in America that's full of garbage and they said no no son I want you to be a doctor I want you to be a lawyer so go to UCLA comprised of Kofrim and Rashaim I want you to get a good education so you get a degree so you can make a lot of money got nothing get no we'll worry about it later on and at that moment these Malachim give him the person that died the permission to hit his father and mother because they're the reason he's there why didn't you instruct your children to study Torah and fulfill mitzvot they are partners to the crime and if he feels embarrassed no I don't want to hit my Yubai Nava I love them then they hit him instead in front of his parents and make his parents suffer watching their son or daughter get hit before the hits begin the person is in shock saying my time has an end no my time came now I'm only 25 I'm only 35 I'm only 75 I have so many years ahead I just did a deal for a million dollars I haven't even matured yet I just bought a house I just finished the kitchen I just did all this stuff I got so much stuff to do and the angels say to him get up your time has arrived and then they open up his eyes and he sees the truth and the first thing that he sees is the Malach HaMavit himself which is as long from one end of the world to the other end of the world meaning he's from the ground all the way to the heavens and his clothes are made of fire and he holds a knife in his hand and at the tip of the knife there is a drop of bile hanging from it the moment that a person sees this Malach HaMavit, he gets so scared that he opens his mouth and the drop falls into their mouth and from that they die from that they become smelly and disgusting from that the person's face becomes discolored and at that moment they actually see a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself as it says for no man can see me and live in Exodus 33 3 during their lifetime they cannot see him but they do see him upon their death another source is Psalm 22 30 before him will bow all those who have descended to the dirt and his soul is not alive meaning that after a person dies they will see a Kadosh Baruch Hu. what they see I have no idea Baruch Hashem I haven't seen it yet the person then immediately testifies that his end has come he realizes okay my end has come and Hashem seals the verdict if he's a righteous person then he gives over his soul to his owner without a fight if he's a Rasha then he still remains stubborn and doesn't want to die no 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 give me more time give me more time even then he has a Yetzirah he doesn't want to listen to his owner Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says just as the wicked are stubborn in this world and don't want to do tshuva, so will the wicked remain stubborn when they die and stand for judgment. As it says in Psalm 112.10, the wicked will see and become angered. In the book, Ya'arot Dvash, in the second Rush, he says if people only knew what punishment exists in Gehenom, they'd literally start crying hysterically, begging a Kadosh Baruch Hu, to simply just not take them there. Don't even take me to Gan Eden. Just don't take me to Gano. I'll do everything. I'll keep mitzvot. I'll keep Torah. I'll become Baba Sali. I'll start teaching. I'll start giving everything I have, all the money, everything. Just don't take me to Gano. If they only understood what it means. Why is it so much worse? Because he gets judged for the vast majority of his sins from the age of 20, with the exception of wasting seed. So the sins that a person made before the age of 20 have lesser of a judgment. It's not that there's no judgment, it's lesser of a judgment. With the exception of wasting seed. Why? Because that, even if you did it at nine years old somehow, that's a, unfortunately, same thing as a 20 years old or 30 years old does it. Rabbi Yosef says, come and see the difference between a man and a beast. An animal endures a lot of suffering in this world. The cow gets slaughtered, and after they get slaughtered, they get skinned, but it doesn't have a judgment after that. It's finished. It's finished its mission. 
came to the world for people to use it. If it's a kosher animal, somebody slaughtered it in a kosher way, if there was a soul of a Jew in there beforehand, that soul can get a tikkun, meaning can benefit out of this slaughter, even though it's painful, even though the skin being uh, skinned is, uh, is painful and so on, but that's it, it's finished. That soul is elevated to the next level. There's no chibuta kever and genom and all the other things that I mentioned, none of that, it's finished. It goes to the next chapter, whatever the next chapter is for it. It doesn't have judgment. But man endures a lot of suffering in this world. Who do you know that's not suffering? Everybody suffers in this world. Some people health issues, some people, you know, emotional issues, some people psychological issues, some people financial issues, some all types, everybody suffers. Everybody has some type of suffering. Waking up early in the morning is a level of suffering. No one wants to wake up early in the morning. Going to work is suffering. Yeah, I love my job. Yeah, but if you didn't have to, you didn't work. You wouldn't work. If you didn't have to work, you wouldn't work. If the, all the money in the world was in your bank, you wouldn't go to work. Why? Because no one wants to work. You want to be on vacation. Reality is a lot of different types of sufferings. Some we bring on ourselves, some are just part of life. But if he's a holy, righteous person, at least he's exempt from judgment. But if he's wicked, if he didn't do tshuva before he died, then he's judged with the most severe judgments. Man endures a lot of suffering in this world, but he also suffers after his death. The moment that a person passes from this world, it's not enough that he's frightened by the Malach Amabit, the angel of death. Did you enthrone your owner every morning and evening? Meaning, did you realize that Kadosh Baruch Hu is watching you at all time? A Kadosh Baruch Hu says to the person, My dear son, my dear daughter, look how I took great care of you. When you were formed in your mother's womb, you were in a miscarriage. When you came out, the air of the world, I set it up to sustain you. And I saved you from suffering. What did you do throughout the 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years you lived? Did you engage in Torah? Did you do kind deeds before me? This is what happens when you meet Hashem. This is what He asks you. If they did those things, they have those things, then they're exempt from judgment. But if not, Akadosh Baruch Hu hands them over to the angels, the damaging angels. In Otsala Mishdrashim, page 94, he says that Genom has seven names. Sheol, Avadon, Be'er Sha'on, Be'er Shachat, Chatzar Mavet, Bor Tachtit, and Tita Yavet. Now Sheol, which is mentioned several times in the Torah, is 300 light years wide and long. Mara says, how big is Gan Eden? It says 60 times the size of earth. How big is Genom? Some say it has no size. Others say it's Genom itself. All of it is 2100 light years long. The reason why they say it has no size is because it continues to increase in size as more and more wicked people enter it. Whoever does tshuva, instead of being beaten, they bring him directly to Gan Eden. But if he dies without tshuva, they bring him to Genom instead. The last verse of the book of Isaiah. What the prophet Isaiah saw. That not only did Isaiah see Genom, but he knows exactly what happens there. Chapter 66, verse 24. It says, He will go out and see the corpses of the men who rebelled against the Shem. For their decay will not cease and their fire will not be extinguished and they will lie in disgrace before all mankind. And the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 33b, and also the Zohar, talks about how this is the source of how for wicked people that do not do tshuva, there is an eternal genom that exists. What did Isaiah actually see himself? And this is the narration. Isaiah went into genom, saw it, and he went into the second house, one of the chambers in there, and he saw two people hanging by their tongues. And Isaiah said to Hashem, O oh, revealer of secrets, reveal to me the secret behind this. Meaning, why are these people being punished like this? They're being hung by their tongues. He said to them, these people, they slandered other people. 
and that's their judgment so then Isaiah goes to the third house meaning another chamber and he saw men being hung by their penises and Isaiah says to Hashem oh revealer of secrets reveal to me the secret behind this why are these people having this specific judgment so Hashem says to him these people leave their wives alone and fornicate with other women so this is their judgment so Isaiah goes to the fourth house and he saw women being hung by their chest by their breasts so Isaiah says to Hashem oh revealer of secrets reveal to me the secret behind this why are these people getting this specific punishment HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him these women reveal their hair on their heads and they tear their clothing meaning they wear immodest clothes and then they sit in marketplaces nursing their children so that they can get people's attention and sin with them and this is what their judgment is a woman walks around immodestly she wants attention fourth house apparently Isaiah goes into the fifth house and he saw a house full of smoke of all sorts of noblemen and treasurers were inside there with Pao, the wicked sitting on top of them guarding the entrance to Geno and Pao saying to all of these people why didn't you learn from me when I was in Egypt Pao still sits there and guards the entrance to Geno primary thing that a person has to have is Yirat Shammai and that's why the Gemara says HaKadosh Baruch Hu only created the world for you to fear him if the whole world was scared of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the world would simply be Gan Eden. If just Am Yisrael was scared of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Mashiach would arrive immediately. But the point is, Abu Karim, that's how valuable Yirat Shamayim is. Learn some of these things over and over and over again on a regular basis, once a month, once every couple of weeks, once a week if necessary, and if you have a really big yetzah, once a day. Until you're scared enough from Hashem that you're not going to make any voluntary sins. You're going to make sins regardless, but at least it's not going to be on purpose. It's not going to be on purpose. You're going to make unintentional sins because you don't know, or you didn't realize, or it's an accident, but at least let it not be on, on purpose. Don't leave your house immodest. Don't waste seat on purpose because you're watching stuff. Don't do that. Why? Because that's on purpose. But don't do any purposeful sins. Don't go to McDonald's or some a non-kosher restaurant because you're really hungry. Find a kosher place or don't eat at all. Don't do any purposeful sins. And after a while, this is going to help you fall in love with a Kadosh Baruch But it's something that you need to learn enough until you understand your role in this world. You are here to serve Akadosh Baruch Hu. He's not here to serve you. to talk about this but we always go to the Chachamim we always go to the Tzadikim we always go to the Gemarot what do they teach? if you look at the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah end of page 16 16b in the beginning of 17a it mentions it twice the righteous can have a benefit and a reward for eternity while the wicked can have a punishment and suffering for eternity Meaning just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu's love and reward can be eternal and unlimited, the wrath of God is also unlimited. Even after Mashiach comes, their genom will not be turned off. You look at Alakha, Shuchan Aruch, mentions that someone that goes against the Kadosh Baruch Hu to such an extent has no share of the world to come. No share of the world to come is just another way for our Chachamim to explain to us what does it mean genom. You look at the Baal Shem Tov, you look at his Chassidim, they mentioned it. We reviewed in one of our shiurim over 1,400 sources from Chassidut. 
how they talk about Geno. This is what Torah is. You could also look at Parashat Kitisa, Parashat Kitavo, Parashat Bechukotai, Azinu. Look at what Rashi says about where Korach is till this day. Geenom is not Kabbalistic. It's not something that only a few know. It's basic level Judaism that unfortunately is almost unheard of in this generation. They ask Rabovadia, what about Geenom? Our minag is to start teaching about Geenom at six years old. If he knows that there is a place of punishment at six years old, you're not going to have to remind him at 60. It's already ingrained in him. Being afraid is actually part of our servitude of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, part of our Avodot Hashem. That's why the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 31b, says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu only created the world in order for you to fear Him. Why? Because if you fear Him, you will serve Him. The Ramban is using a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, chapter 3, Mishnah number 1, says the fear of God will intensify in your heart. You work on your humility, you work on your Yirat Shamayim. The Torah says that Yirat Shamayim is the only thing that's going to save you. But just in case the system fails, the Gemara says first, in Masechet Brachot, try to grab a book of Torah, some Gemara, some Chumash, something. Press play on one of the Shurim. Yaron Ruven slash Geenom. Yaron Ruven Kafa Kela. Oh, it's one of those scary Shurim. Press play. That doesn't work. Say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Why? Remind yourself, there's a God that's watching. Sometimes it doesn't work. Chachamim say, after this Yirat Shemaim intensifies in your heart, but sometimes it doesn't work, think for a second about the day that you're going to die. There's going to be a day, Malach HaMabit shows up and says, you're the next customer. All of us experience this. Our Neshamot are no less than 5,779 years old. We all have neshamot. There's no such thing as a baby. All of our neshamot were at Mount Sinai 3,300 years ago. The body that you have today is simply like clothing. Today you wore a suit, tomorrow you're gonna wear something else. That's what the body is. So the baby is simply wearing that shell now, but in his previous carnation, in his previous life, he wore a different suit, a different body. Similar face, but not the same. Similar name, but not the same. Why do you have to come back? Because he did not complete his mission. She did not complete her mission. They made certain sins that they have to make up for. And Hashem decided to give them another chance. After they paid for part of the sins in Gainom, they were let out in order to come back to this world to fix the rest. Now when a person is found guilty in his judgment, they give him over to the damaging angels who bring him to different places. The path is dark and slippery. Whoever does tshuva, instead of being beaten, they bring him directly to Gan Eden. But if he dies without tshuva, they bring him to Gehenom instead. But before all of this is done, they also get to meet Avraham and Yitzchak. And Avraham and Yitzchak come to him and say, my son, what have you done in this world which you existed for all these years? If he says, I bought fields and vineyards and I worked on them all my days, Avraham and Yitzchak say to him, you fool, you didn't learn from David HaMelech that the land and all of its constants are Hashem's. As it says in Tehilim 24.2, they take him and bring in the next person who says, I acquired gold and silver. And then Avraham and Yitzchak say to him, you fool, didn't you learn from the prophets, Liya Kesev and Liya Zahav, Neum Hashem Tzavahot. Hashem says to the prophet Chagai, mine is the money, mine is the gold. But if they bring a Talmit Chacham, they bring somebody that kept to write mitzvot, they bring a tzaddikah there. Avraham and Yitzhak say, what have you done in the world that they exist? And he said, oh, I follow the Torah, I taught in the Torah all the days of my life. So Avraham and Yitzhak say, ah, may peace come and rest upon your lying place. And Hashem himself accepts this person smilingly. This Kabotai Yekarim is one of the foundations of our Torah. A moment you're going to have a test, a big test. This is the type of stuff that hopefully you'll be reminded of and not do it. Loving Hashem is a wonderful thing to acquire. But the reality is that loving Hashem by itself is not going to stop you from sinning. It won't stop you from sinning. Being afraid will stop you from sinning. And that's why it's actually something that you see in our Sidu. Tehilim say, Ovre Be'emek Abacha. Those who pass through the valley of tears into a wellspring. So the Gemara Masechet Baba Metzia says, what is this valley of tears? What is it? It says that's one of the chambers in Geno. 
this Rabotei Karim is actually part of our Mincha. Every Jew has to do it at least once a day. You start with Alvi, saying Hashem, we're praying because in case we sin, we don't want you to destroy us. Right in the beginning of the prayer. Point is Rabotei that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world in such a way that we operate best based on fear. You don't speed on the highway because you don't want to get a ticket, you don't want to get into an accident, you don't want to hurt somebody else, and so on and so forth. We don't take stuff that doesn't belong to us because we don't want to get caught, we don't want to be embarrassed, we don't want to hurt somebody else, and so on and so forth. We don't sit at home and do nothing instead of and, and go to work instead, even though we don't like work. The reality is we go to work even though we don't want to. Why? Because we don't want to be homeless, we don't want to be, we don't want to starve to death, and so on and so forth. We don't yell at our spouse and insult them because again, we know that if we do yell at them, we do insult them. It'll hurt the marriage, it'll hurt the relationship, it'll hurt a lot of things. Loving Hashem is fantastic. It's just not something that, first of all, everybody can acquire. Number two, you can't acquire it without fearing Hashem first anyway. And three, that by itself is not going to stop you from sinning. That love of Hashem is not by itself going to stop you from cheating on your wife. There are many guys that cheat on their wife even though they love them. There are many women that cheat on their husband even though they love them. There was a recent horrible statistic that came out of Eretz Yisrael, Hashem Yerachem. And they said that women and men are just as likely to cheat on each other now. In the past, there was a men's problem because of their physical desires. Apparently, the women have become like men. They're just as likely to cheat on each other. Why? But they all love each other. They all said, oh, I love them at first sight. I love her at first sight. Okay, so why'd you cheat on her? Oh, you know, uh, but you love her though, no? Yeah, I love her. Why? Because love by itself does not stop us from doing stupid things. Primary thing that a person has to have is Yirat Shemai. And that's where the Gemara says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu only created the world for you to fear Him. You have to acquire Yirat Shemai so you don't sin. Because when you sin, you disconnect from him. When you disconnect from him, he's forced to punish you. He doesn't want to punish you, but he's forced to do it. Why? Because there has to be a reward and a punishment system in this world. If just Am Yisrael was scared of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Mashiach would arrive immediately. Better yet, if 10 Jews, Minyan, all had Yirat Shamayim under one roof, they're all here for Hashem himself, the Gemara says Mashiach arrives on the spot. Whether we like it, whether we agree with it is irrelevant. We're not the ones running the world. If the whole world was scared of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the world would simply be Gan Eden. But the point is, Rabbi Tayyip Karim, that's how valuable Yirat Shemayim is. If you watch the Shirim on a regular basis, you'll build a Yirat Shemayim. You'll build a foundation of fearing Hashem, at least you're not going to make any purposeful sins. This is going to help you fall in love with HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually enjoy your life for what it really is. Learn the Torah, learn the beautiful things, learn some of the scary things and see how they are also beautiful as well. But really have a true connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not just be one of these fakers that walks around as if they're a perfect tzaddik, as if they have everything good and no matter what they do, Hashem is going to give them the Gan Eden. The beard grows by itself, doesn't make you religious. The suit doesn't make you religious. On Wall Street, they also wore suits. What makes you religious is how you act and what's inside you and what comes out of your mouth. That's what makes you religious. If you allow your eyes to look at Torah, to look at good things, that's already a great start. If you allow good things to come out of your mouth, like Divrei Torah, like compliments, like good things, honesty, that's good. If you go to places that are good, full of holiness, full of Kedusha, that's good. If you look the part, that makes you perfect. That makes you perfect person to go to Gan Eden. That's what Hashem wants. But if you don't want to do that, you want to eat McDonald's once in a while because you like the cheeseburger. You like the chicken sandwich from Burger King. You want to walk around with a shirt that's just a little bit tight so they can see exactly how your body's shaped. You want to walk around with a short skirt so everybody says, wow, you're looking good today. You're going to do a lot of those things, then guess what? You're destroying yourself. It's like somebody that jumps off of a bridge. There's nothing you can do, you already jumped. So these shuim, it's not necessarily something that you need to learn all day, every day. But it's something that you need to learn enough until you understand your role in this world. That you are here to serve a Baruch Hu. 
He's not here to serve you. If you're tired because you don't think that you're supposed to be a servant of Hashem, that means I haven't done a good enough job yet. So now I'm going to tell you what's really going to happen. Why? Because you need to be a servant of Hashem. That's the job. That's the point of this world. That's why you exist. You exist to serve Hashem. It's not as hard as you would think, I promise you. And trust me when I tell you, even if you find it extremely difficult to be modest among all of the modest women around you, extremely difficult not to eat taref, to eat non-kosher because you have a big appetite for non-kosher things. You're addicted to, uh, I don't know, shrimp or something, the, the bugs of the sea. You're, you're addicted to the cockroaches of the ocean. Call them lobster. You're addicted to it. Trust me when I tell you, it's going to be much harder in Gano. Why? Because over there they force feed you. You understand? Here you chose. So even if it's hard for you not to waste seed, hard for you not to not touch somebody that's not your wife, hard for you not to let a man touch you when he's not your husband, hard for you to give tzedakah, hard because you, you know you love your money so much you want it all for yourself, hard for you to fulfill the Torah, hard for you to learn, it's hard for you. Trust me when I tell you, as hard as it is in the beginning, it's not even 1% of 1% of 1% as hard as Gainom is for the first minute. And Gainom only gets more hard. So this is what we need to learn in order to have at least a foundation to get an understanding that this is what our role is in this world. And the best part about it is that once a person accepts that she's a servant of Hashem, she's a representation of Hashem, he's a representation of Hashem, He's a servant of Hashem. Guess what? All of a sudden, the mitzvot become fun. Why? That's my job. If my job is to fulfill the Torah and do mitzvot, then that means that every time I did it, you're going to get some gratification out of it. Why? You did a job. You did a good job. You kept Shabbat. You're happy at the end of Shabbat. Wow, I kept the whole Shabbat by myself. You ate kosher. Oh, Baruch Hashem. Look, I ate and I said a bracha in the beginning and at the end. You feel a sense of achievement, believe it or not. Eating becomes significant. Why? Because it's not just you eating to, to just fulfill your appetite. It's even your eating becomes serving of Hashem. It's not that you're just reading and okay, you got smarter. No, now you're reading Torah. You're actually learning about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're learning more things to do. How to serve Him even better. Your reading becomes significant. It's not that you just walk down the street and it's just like everybody else, you go to the store. No, during that walk to the street, you watch your eyes. Everything that's immodest, you look away. So even you walking to the store, to the deli, to the supermarket, to the laundromat, becomes a mission for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why? I didn't look. I didn't look where I don't belong. Going outside, going outside as a Bati said, you are a walking Kiddush Hashem. Why? Everybody's looking at you. Instead of looking at all the, all the immodest women, they're looking at the one modest one. And everybody else is naked. This is the only one that looks like a queen. You're a walking Kiddush Hashem. Everyone wants to marry the princess. You walk around as a modest woman, you are sanctifying a Kadosh Baruch Hu's name simply by existing. A married woman walking around with a Kisui Rosh hat or a scarf on her head, the opposite of everybody else. It's even more significant in this generation. But then Rabotai Yekarim, if a person doesn't do anything that the Torah here says, then just know that the Zohar Kadosh says that for every single body part, they sin. One of the things that they will experience in Chibuta Kevil, in the grave, is that there will be a spiritual snake coming out of every single hole and every single part of their body that sin. If they sin with their breath, there's gonna be a spiritual snake there constantly torturing them in that area. If she walked around without Kisui Rosh, all of our hair is gonna turn into snakes like Medusa. I'm not even giving you 1% of what it says and it's already scaring me and I'm telling you. It's not worth it. As hard as doing tshuva is, trust me, it's much, much easier than the consequence of not doing tshuva. Because all of us at some point leave this world. There's not the Shem, it's after all of us do tshuva, regardless of the age. Who cares about the age as long as you did tshuva? It doesn't matter when you die. It matters if you did tshuva before you died. 
If you did tshuva, then you go in a, a great, fantastic place for eternity. What difference does it make that you're leaving this world at 30, at 40, at 90, at 100? Who cares? You're going to an eternal place of good. Yeah, the people behind you, they're sad because you're not around anymore and so on. But yeah, but if they really know that you're a tzaddik, you're a tzaddikah, you're going to Ganet and they're happy when you die. Why? He's going to eternity. He's going to eternity of good. Who cares when you die as long as you did tshuva first? But if you died without doing tshuva, Hashem Yachem, even if you died at 120, it actually makes the case worse. Why? You made more sins. Made more sins, made more judgment. So instead of thinking when you look at people, instead of saying happy birthday to people and thinking, you know, hopefully he lasts a long time, hopefully she lasts a long time. No, hopefully they do tshuva. That should be your prayer for yourself, your prayer for everybody else. That's the number one thing. Why? Because if a person does tshuva, they connect to a kadosh Baruch Hu while they're alive, they're assured to have an eternity of good. And that's the best thing that you could ever give somebody. What do you think? Hashem is not going to give you even more money so you can help even more people when you're helping all of his kids come home? Help people do tshuva. That's the only thing you should do. People that help people do tshuva. Unfortunately, there's not many. But actually, people that help people do tshuva, like change their life, not many. Tshuva means that you help somebody change their life their lifestyle, the way they look at the world, their perspective of the world, what they're going to do in this world, they change their life. The Hasid of Rav, Rabbi Islami Salant, Rav Blazer, says that even in his generation over a hundred years ago, where there's countless medicines for every ailment, every sickness, every pain you have, there's 500 different medicines for you, he says, except one ailment. He says the spiritual ailment. The neshama. There's only one cure, but no one wants to be a doctor. There's one cure for the neshama. What? Give him musar, teach him how to do tshuva, but nobody wants to be a doctor, he says. That, there's not many people signing up for that job. So that's why I say, Rabotai, you can be that person, either directly, indirectly. I brought the books with me if you want to read them for yourself. There's Shara Gigulim, there's the Rashid Chokhmah, uh, Mishneh Torah from the Rambam, Ilchot Tshuva. The Pekiavot and so on and so forth. The point being is you have to read them and then do what it says. That's what we're trying to tell you. We're saving you the time. Now you have it all on a silver platter and now you have a decision to make. You're going to do tshuva, you're not going to do tshuva. Tshuva is something you do a little bit every day. Another mitzvah, another mitzvah, another mitzvah. You get better and better and better and little by little, your life changes. Not doing tshuva is also a decision every day. Every day you keep eating not kosher. Every day you look at things that are inappropriate. Every day you keep going against Hashem. Not a good idea. Bezot Hashem just gives us enough chizuk. Get closer and closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu as He wants and as He desires for us to do. Bezot Hashem we do real tshuva. Lead other people to do tshuva. Get Am Yisrael as a whole to do tshuva. Even if they're very very far away or they think they're very very close. Irrelevant. This is what everybody needs to learn. This is the very basics of the Torah. You need to know that one day you're going to die and you need to know what's going to happen there. This is the beginning. I have the good part, I have the bad part. If I want a good part, I have to act accordingly. If I want to act the, the bad part, I have to act accordingly. Everybody needs to learn these things because this is the basics. This is simply Judaism 101. Even though nobody has heard this until today. Every single person needs to know the basics. Once you know the basics, the other shame you'll act accordingly.